Good morning friends. What has greatly interested both the students and research scholars of British literature is not just the rich wealth of literature that it has but also the glamour of its uh, history, the glamour of the European history. So has history ever been a kind of a glamour? It's a fact of wars, it's a fact of sufferings. Of course we know that but then when we come to the European history we have beautiful characters Historical characters like Napoleon, Joan of Arc, Mazzini, the great uh, Queen Elizabeth. So in the process of knowing this history, we wonder whether these are really historical characters or some mythical characters or some e imaginary fictional characters. They have such variety in them. So no author has been that independent of the happenings of his age. And if at all there has been any author who is so independent of the happenings of his age, it could be again a kind of a myth. Why am I talking about this? Because we are talking about some writer today who has been greatly affected by the age in which he lived. John Ruskin. Who was John Ruskin? John Ruskin was a prose stylist, a prose writer of the 19th century. He was a great social reformer also. But more than that, how could he become the person that uh, we see him today? When John Ruskin was born in 1819 uh, and uh, when he was a child, he could witness the Napoleonic Wars around him. So when we talk, we talk of Napoleonic Wars, we must see, uh, we must have a glance or a bit of knowledge of uh, the relations that existed uh, between Great Britain and France. France had just uh, uh, ended up uh, with its French Revolution and uh, Napoleon had become the next ruler there. He had come to the thrones. And the moment he came to his thrones, he had one big dream. It was not just conquering uh, many uh, nations. Apart from that, uh, his dream was Great Britain. So once he conquers Great Britain, he has done with his kingship or whatever. His dreams. Now, he having his eyes on Great Britain, he had built up a huge army for himself. But we must see now here, when we look at the European history, Britain had to do nothing with uh, the big armies of the neighboring nations because since Britain was uh, an island, it had its uh, brilliant army. Even today we talk of the army that existed during the 19th century. So there was a tug of war between uh, the navy of Britain and the army of uh, Napoleon. So however strong Napoleon was, he used to wage war after the war, war after war on Great Britain, but every time it was a kind of a failure. Though he had conquered some other European nations, had found a coalition against Europe, against sorry Great Britain, he couldn't succeed in uh, conquering Great Britain only because of its brilliant uh, navy and the tactics of uh, the Britain um, Parliament in those days. Why am I talking this? After seven years of continuous warfare with Britain, the, the plans that Napoleon had made uh, to conquer it and the type of revolutions that went in uh, France as well as in uh, uh, Britain are all uh, have f uh, found in the literature of that period. Whether it is the liberation of man or whether it is the suffering of the industry or whether it is the military pain and the forming of the new labor class, all this is affected also by the Napoleon warfare that was there in those days. So uh, there were great plans made by Napoleon like he requested the coalition to break uh, uh, um, uh, the business uh, relations with Europe but then Europe was also a flourishing uh, business uh, country those days. Now after having conquered Ireland also, uh, Ireland, uh, England and Scotland together uh, had become United Kingdom and the Great Britain had changed its name to United Kingdom. The United word itself showed how uh, powerful a nation they are. At last in the Battle of Waterloo, Napoleon was badly defeated and then there is the history again. So why, uh, wh how does it affect uh, the writer that we have picked today, John Ruskin. John Ruskin had read a lot of European history as a child. He was mostly educated in the, in the house. Uh, his father uh, was a, a kind of a, a romantic uh, a person. He, had, uh, he was a follower of uh, uh, William Turner, the greatest painter of those days. Uh, William Turner was the uh, romantic uh, 
painters alive in the sense even today uh, the, 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 the kind of painting that he did is being followed in the in that field so all the paintings of William Turner's were in front of uh, John Ruskin's eyes and uh, naturally uh, the romanticism was kind of an inspiration for him and he wanted to do uh, some career in painting because of the influence of his father over him and since he was born in a very well to do business family a rich business family he had access to uh, choose any career that he wanted and his mother was a very pious woman she introduced a bible to john ruskin and uh, then became uh, then was born a kind of a moralist in john ruskin so morality ethics on one side the essentialities of christian religion and the uh, piousness of the bible on one side and the romantic spirit and the individual soul on the other side all together influenced the uh, the childhood and youth of john ruskin now after uh, becoming a kind of a painter he also uh, he chose his profession as a painter he also became a, a kind of an art critic because uh, he since he had had the knowledge of the romantic paintings of those time and since he was the follower of william james uh, so critique on art and architecture was also uh, his forte and in his youthful days he had an opportunity to travel uh, the whole of europe he went for a tour and with this romantic zeal in him and the kind of that youthfulness in him not knowing what seriousness was lying in front of him uh, he traversed uh, many countries of europe where he found that uh, a kind of a revolution was going on the social and economic uh, life of people uh, the higher uh, middle class uh, people had uh, become the rich people had be had become capitalists and the kind of the budding industries and the economy of europe filled in so many different things that he came across two different sections of society the capitalists and the labor class what we call as the bourgeois and the proletariat so having these two things so may, uh, and uh, so many confusions attached to it he came back to england and then uh, started a kind of a uh, writing on that uh, he published a few articles in the journals of oxford he also wrote some poetry for the oxford magazines he won many prizes but then he was not satisfied he knew that he was going to write something for the lower middle class and the poor class that was uh, eating him uh, inside and he came out uh, with his book uh, modern painters in 1843 and he had to produce that book as a lover of uh, william turner because uh, those were the days when uh, the neo classicals had attacked the romantic spirit in uh, uh, art architecture of england and uh, somehow uh, john ruskin uh, uh, went ahead to defend turner and his paintings and that was the result of modern uh, uh, painting which was published in three volumes and it had immediate uh, uh, success and it was a popular kind of a book and that uh, not only uh, gave him uh, further inspiration in the field of painting but also uh, inspiration in the field of writing and days passed uh, he was not just uh, he was not very happy with this uh, modern painting because he wanted to introduce some kind of a prose for british uh, readers wherein he could highlight the sufferings of the uh, industrial people and uh, this was the time when he came across uh, walter scott uh, he met uh, wordsworth and they influenced him a lot and he had just begin up with his uh, uh, beautiful prose writing uh, there was a kind of upheaval in the life of john ruskin so what was that one was the failure of his marriage and then the death of uh, uh, william uh, turner in 1950 1851 and also the great sarcasm irony that he had to face uh, due to his uh, the, the kind of a moral and a romantic mixture kind of a life so now okay the death of turner was a big blow apart from that what had happened in his personal life he had married uh, effy gray uh, who was a, a daughter of his uh, family friends uh they were friends uh, from childhood they knew each other very well and they had uh, in one way been lovers also from childhood but there was a kind of a huge uh, age gap between them she was almost 19 when she married uh, john ruskin who was 29 and having been so many uh, highly qualified and have, and having been a kind of a social thinker uh, he i don't know how well he settled with effie gray because she was un under educated for him 
Uh, and uh, she was a kind of a romantic lady. She was flirtatious. She was very beautiful. And she had a lot many admirers. And that was her hobby in one way. She somehow could not cope up with John Ruskin. And after five years of marriage, she had to divorce him. Not just because they did not have that kind of intimacy, but also because they did not uh, have children for them. And not only that, uh, she was, uh, even when she was uh, in marriage with John Ruskin, uh, she fell in love with uh, Ruskin's friend Milias, who was a pre raphaelite painter. And imagine the pain that uh, John Ruskin suffered, not only from the professional point of view, but also from his uh, uh, personal relations with F.E. Gray. And that was a kind of a great critical discussion in those days because John Ruskin had, uh, had, had introduced himself as a great writer also, as a great art critic and people, uh, he, he had gained uh, his own uh, colony, his own followers. And this was the kind of discussion that went on him. And uh, I'm talking of Effie Gray because she also turned into a kind of a literary figure uh, in those days. A play was also written on her, The Countess and uh, how uh, she cheats the husband and all that. Uh, somehow at some point of life, uh, after having seen the play and after having seen the kind of critical approach that people had on Effie Gray, Ruskin uh, uh, confesses that it was he who could not make a life with her because he was too much morally bound and the kind of woman that he wanted to see in Effie Gray was not found. So this is how we can enter into the uh, psychology of John Ruskin. Uh, what exactly he wanted to pick out of men and women of his days is yet a kind of a research going on. So the kind of uh, satire that was there being written on John Ruskin uh, was a big pain and also a blow for his budding career. So he immediately renounced London and he went for a European tour. He was totally imbalanced and he was almost on the uh, brink of uh, getting back from uh, the field of writing and painting of course. And see God uh, where there is a uh, will, there is a way. This is what uh, happened with John Ruskin. He was in search of a person who could tell him, who could influence him as to what his goal should be in life. And uh, this is how uh, he met uh, Carlyle in England. And you know what Carlyle was. I uh, was also brought in a very strict puritanical family, but then not very much influenced by the Bible. He was uh, uh, sympathetic towards the uh, common lot of those days and he was a very optimistic kind of a person because he said that we should always have a look at the history when we are in a kind of a depression. So he introduced uh, 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 John Ruskin to the huge historical literature and he taught him much of history. We also know uh, much about Carlyle's books, uh, the French Revolution, Heroes and Hero Worship. These books have been uh, masterpieces in the field of world literature. Having been influenced by Carlyle, Carlyle was, I mean, Ruskin was back to life. He came back and then in 1860, he came up with his Unto This Last. And the moment he wrote his Unto This Last, he came to know that this is what he wanted to do in life and the time has come. Unto This Last is kind of a socio-economic commentary of those days. Uh, and uh, he had some seven essays into it but uh, there was no permission for the publication of it because it was so, too severe an attack on some of the economists of those days. Uh, but then uh, there, there was a kind of a, a, a midway found. If the uh, seven essays were reduced to four, okay, the book could be published. So uh, at last he had to condense the book from seven to four essays. But he was quite shrewd here. So in the fourth essay, he almost assembled, amalgamated all the remaining essays. That is a different matter. Now when we come to unto this last, what has mattered the students and scholars most is the first two essays of the book, which we are going to talk today. Unto this last is a very beautiful title and we will talk of the title first and then we will go to the two essays that we are discussing. The first, the roots of honor and the second, the veins of wealth. Uh, this uh, title unto this last is uh, uh, being taken from uh, one of the parables of Jesus Christ. It so happens in the past uh, that Jesus Christ was uh, moving in the uh, uh, eastern countries 
and uh, mid eastern countries and uh, the, the people they were very poor and there was lot of tyranny also there uh, when he wanted to uplift those people uh, he used to have his great sayings also but it so happened, he used to tell people that okay there is so much of misery but there is also something called as a beautiful land heaven of uh, where you would be reaching some day and if you uh, wish if you make your minds you can have a heaven on earth also the common people the poor people the uneducated illiterate people uh, could not understand what jesus christ was trying to tell them so often on and on jesus used to convince people uh, his principles or his ideas uh, through the uh, parables so we have a, a parable here which we you should know before knowing the title unto this last there was a vineyard owner he was very rich and it was the time for him to harvest the grapes uh so he wanted labor so he went to the city to get some labor to harvest his crop and when he went to the city it was somewhere morning 6 o'clock and uh, it was the tradition those days that uh, early morning uh, the, uh, the the labor class people used to come and stand on the streets or somewhere inside uh, certain streets and the uh, land uh, lords or the, uh, the, the the people who owned land or who, who wanted some work to be done in the field or factories could come to those areas and pick uh, whatever labor what kind of labor they uh, wanted for their purpose so this is how this uh, owner of the vineyard also came to the city he picked certain laborers and he went back with them and these laborers worked from 6 to 12 but then there was a very little harvest being done so he wanted some more labor and with the first stock of his harvest uh, he came to the city again after having sold his harvest uh, he picked up a second group of labor for him and it was 12 o'clock and by the time they come it uh, came to the field it was almost afternoon and uh, then again at 3 o'clock when he saw again he wanted some more labor he went back and he bought some other labor and again in the evening at 6 o'clock when he went again he felt that he wishes to have some labor but then uh, it was almost getting evening and he thought uh, whatever labor now he has in this field is enough somehow they'll finish the work by night but then a few uh, section of uh, laborers who were standing there were almost in tears because uh, they hadn't eaten anything from the morning and how could they return empty hands back home for not having had a job for that day uh, he asks them uh, why are you standing unemployed like this why don't you go and work and then the labor people tell him that uh, we always want to work because we belong to the labor class our profession our occupation is that we should render our physical labor to uh, to to our, our masters but then nobody has chosen us even if we are fit and we have been waiting for someone to choose us now he is so sympathetic towards them that even if there is no need he takes them back and by the time he takes them back it's almost dusk and then after a few hours of work it's almost night and that is the end of the day's work and the harvest was done and now he calls all the laborers uh, to pay the wages and before he could pick the first lot of labor uh, la laborers for his uh, farm he had told them he had fixed one penny for the day so one penny they were very happy because it was too much uh, in those days and they could satisfy not only themselves but also their family for the next coming days so with the uh, when they came and stood in a row uh, he was ready to pay one penny to each of them but then the vineyard uh, owner said that let those who came late in the evening be first paid there was a rage in those people who had come early in the morning at 6 and from 6 they had almost worked up to 9 and now the mother owner is wanting to pay those people who had come last so now anyway he keeps on paying and when uh, uh, the, the people who had worked a lot come and face the owner the question him what is this uh, discrimination that you are doing it is actually we who should be paid more than those people then he says why this interference i will pay the same unto this last so i am going to pay the same to all the people that they are that, that are standing in the queue it is my decision and you have no word to speak here because you were fixed to a one penny and you have been paid one penny you should be happy that your labor is being paid for you but then they are not satisfied give us an explanation as to why you did this why why do you have special sympathy for those people who came and joined you late 
Then he tells them, there is nothing uh, called a sympathy in this. If I don't pay them today, one penny, they would, if I pay them half and if they took it back home, they would neither feed themselves nor the family properly and they would be unfit for the next day's work. So the next day's work also would be in the same way with their ill health. Again, they would be going empty hand in the coming days too. So now if I pay them one penny, they'll go back home, feed themselves and their family uh, so well that they will be totally fit for the next day's work. So tomorrow morning, in case anybody needs them, they are fit to work from six o'clock. So this is the intention I had when I paid them. I wanted to send them back home because they were standing from morning till evening. Though they didn't have work, they had been suffering uh, the, the heat and the, the fury of the sun. So that had made out weak. So let them go home and take rest and be ready for the next day's work. So after having uh, heard this parable, what did the uh, followers of uh, Jesus Christ learn? Uh, Jesus Christ told them, uh, there is one simple thing in life. Uh, look at the people in the way you wish people to look at you. If you do that, there will be a natural heaven around you. But then the people never understood because there was so much of enmity, there was so much of oppression, jealousy around them. But then somehow this is the how Jesus used to teach his people. So that phrase unto this last from that particular parable was taken by John Ruskin. So that each labor working in a factory should be paid the same and there should not be any kind of discrimination when people are working on the same thing. So if there are different uh, 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 levels of working, let the payment be different. But when there is a same single kind of a working system, why should they be paid in different ways? So this is how the thoughts in John Ruskin's mind came and the title unto this last hand. Now let's come uh, to uh, the first essay. The roots of honor. Roots, as you know, is something that has come from our traditions. It is on the roots of something that we exist as human beings and the society exists. Now, what is this honor? Honor is nothing but the dignity of a person, the respect that we give a person or the esteem that a person has. So now, if I want to respect the other or if the master wants to respect the uh, laborer or if the employer wants to respect his employee, there should be a kind of a pious uh, respect in his mind. So what is this pious kind of a respect or dignity? The roots of honor should take birth in the person's conscience, not in, on just the tip of the tongue. So if you want to respect someone, it should take birth in your conscience. And what is this conscience? Uh, we call it Atma Sakshi. So once it is there embedded in the soul and in the, uh, in the minds, and then when it comes out, it is there with people forever. You, you won't change. So once there is a right kind of honor given to the uh, to people, there is naturally a kind of a uh, reformation of society. So now we've understood the title. Now what is it that he talks in the roots of honor? Uh, this is a very severe blow. Uh, he has attacked three uh, political economists of those days. Adam Smith, J.S. Mill, and uh, David Ricardo. These were the people uh, who had literally, uh, uh, I mean, they had uh, created a kind of a, a great revolution in the, uh, in the field of political economy. Students, you know what is an economy, but then what is this political economy? For this, we have to go back to Adam Smith. Uh, Adam Smith belonged to 18th century. Uh, J.S. Mill and uh, David Ricardo uh, belonged to, they were his contemporaries, John Ruskin's contemporaries. He literally hated them like anything. Uh, uh, and due to the influence of Turner and his father also, that is there in his life. Uh, to know something about Adam Smith and who doesn't know Adam Smith, he is the father of economics. He is just not the father of economics, he is the father of capitalism. So what is this capitalism? Okay, we will have to go to some other phrase, laissez-faire. This is nothing but a French term that says, leave us alone. What does this mean? This is a term used in the field of economics wherein the economists tell the government that you should have least interference in the economic system of the nation. So economic or the economy of a nation should be very much independent from the political and social intervention. 
this was very popular in Fr France. So uh, the capitalists uh, or Adam Smith rather imbibed this term and he came with, uh, with a concept called capitalism wherein the rich people who had wealth and uh, they invested it in some factories or industries. Uh, they had a kind of a, a natural monopoly over it and they could make their own rules on it. And since they are working for the benefit of the nation's economy, they would do good things in their field. But the only condition was that the nation should have or the government should have very less intervention with them. And there was also a kind of right exercised by those capitalists that is the accumulation of wealth. You will not question how much of wealth we are uh, uh, accumulating for ourselves because uh, we are also contributing to the nation's economy. So this was a kind of an understanding between the uh, government and the economy uh, with the coming of Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, which uh, is a kind of a masterpiece in the field of economics and of course it is being too much uh, uh, criticized today, that is a different matter. Now having been influenced by Adam Smith, uh, we have J.S. Mill and David Ricardo. Uh, let us take J.S. Mill now. He was not only uh, a follower of Adam Smith's policies and writings and principles, but he came up with something different also. He came up with the utilitarianism in life. And what is this utilitarianism? An economist or an industrialist or a businessman or a merchant or a owner of a small shop also has to look at his work from the utilitarian point of view. You cannot mix up emotions and economy, emotions and work. So work is something totally different from the social aspect of life. So this is what J.S. Mill uh, introduced uh, to the uh, British economy. Now what is that uh, which Ruskin attacks in this essay, uh, The Roots of Honor? He attacks three things. Uh, the uh, polit okay. Before that, I must explain what is political economy. Economy is nothing but the uh, study of uh, wealth and the economic conditions of a nation. This political economy means the government's influence on economy is too little. So the government part, that is political interference in the economic side of life, together has formed this phrase political economy. All the political economists are. Uh, democratic of course in their way of exercising in, in their wealth. Apart from that they are also free to accumulate their own wealth where the government cannot interfere. So this is the meaning of political. You have to read a bit and then you uh, understand what exactly it is. Now coming back to rules of honor the first thing that uh, John Ruskin wanted to attack was uh, the political economist said that the inconstants should be eliminated. Uh, what is this? This is a quite a difficult thing to understand but still we will make it easy. Uh, the inconstance means all those uh, people who are working as laborers in a factory have no rights to exercise their uh, sentiments or they, they have no rights to have a kind of a social atmosphere in a uh, place of work. That means uh, a human has to come to the factory merely as a worker and all the working hours he has to think nothing of his social life. When he is inside the factory he is totally an economical part of the industry and that is why he is being paid. And uh, Ruskin wondered how is this maths, is this science to decide like that? A human's uh, the, 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 the impulses are not being controlled by him most of the times because it is the chemical reaction going inside uh, the body. This is what Ben Johnson some other day uh, spoke about the uh, comedy of uh, humors. That whenever there is an excess of humor in the body, you become uh, uh, angry or you become sad or immediately you start crying and you do not know why you are crying and there is so much of anxiety level. This is not just because of the functionings of the heart or the functionings of the emotions. Uh, this is because of the uh, uh, act of the humors in the body. That is how we say because I was very acidic, uh, I behaved like that. So this is the scientific approach to the sensory behavior of a man. So this is how John, uh, I mean Ruskin defended. Is he a kind of a maths formula that uh, you, you, he has to behave in the same way from morning till evening? No, he will have his own uh, physical and emotional changes. So uh, this was a kind of an attack. And the second attack was that uh, regarding the uh, 
Kovida's uh, machine. What is this term? All the laborers in the factory are kind of a Kovida's machines. Kovida's machines means, of course, they behave very loyal and very good and they're very hard kind of hard working kind of people. Okay, uh, you expect us to give them certain facilities, we give. But that is there in the blood of the workers that they are working on such a rich farm. Uh, which they would like to possess some or the other day. So in case there is a kind of a labor union that would be a great threat to the uh, capitalists. So they don't want to any uh, kind of a social gathering or any kind of uh, sentimentalizing of their work. So Covidus machine means good person having good qualities uh, of his skillful work and apart from that he has a hidden desire of possessing uh, over which he is working. So this is how the capitalists do not want to trust the laborers and that is why they have maintained that distance. And the third thing that John Ruskin attacked was the, uh, the, the, the wages. So in those days uh, it was not like uh, you will work for a month and you are paid uh, uh, at the end of the month and uh, so and this continues. It was not like that. It was daily wages kind of a system. Dinaguli. Even today we have that Dinaguli Paddhati. So a, a, a particular worker will have the security of his uh, uh, work only for that particular day. From morning till evening he works and if he has satisfied his master he is being paid. There is no surety that the very uh, next day also uh, he will be accepted in the same firm. Maybe uh, that there were certain, okay, there were certain uh, working conditions and depending on that those rules were made. So John Ruskin said, how much insecurity you are providing your labor class people? So uh, imagine what kind of a hostility would exist between the masters or the employer and the employee. You are the owners, you have your own securities of your, uh, in, uh, your firms. How will these poor people interfere into the business of your economy? So they just want wages, they are working for their stomachs and it is very difficult for those working class people to come to you. And when this was very much critically uh, looked after, uh, I mean answered by the capitalists, uh, in the roots of honor, uh, John Ruskin goes to the extent of telling that, come on, it's time now to uh, come up with strikes. So the concept of a labor union or the concept of strikes and uh, the concept of unity, it was all introduced uh, with uh, the coming of unto this last and uh, there was a kind of a havoc in the field of economists or the um, business class people those days. So along with that, uh, uh, Ruskin also tells about uh, uh, five sections of society which have to work very sincerely, loyally towards the upliftment of society. One is the soldier who looks at the, the, the country's uh, uh, boundaries and then you have the priest who is, teach, who is uh, purifying the people inside the country. Uh, or uh, pastor and then uh, you have the lawyer who is uh, giving you justice and then uh, you have the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the nowhere in this section a teacher is evolved uh, question why because uh, a teacher of course does his uh, duty loyally so he need not be uh, fit into this section and you also have the merchant in this section because a merchant often plays with the mindset of the labor class people. So a merchant, all these people, five sections of society had to perform loyally to the upliftment of society. And this is how he ends up with the roots of honor saying that it's high time you respect the labor class people. And now briefly let us come to the veins of wealth. This is again a strange uh, title. We have veins in the human body, in the animal body, but then what is this veins of wealth? What do the veins do in the human body? Okay, They carry the blood to the heart and once the blood is purified, they carry it back to other cells providing them nutrition and oxygen. And this is how the functioning of the human body carries on in a very healthy way. Now if you consider society as a human body, okay, now you have to consider society as a human body and it has its own veins wherein the wealth from below goes and reaches the heart. The heart here is the capitalists and the veins that carry the wealth is uh, the connection between the labor class and the capitalists. So once there is a field of workers and once there is an output of wealth, this goes into the veins, you know, it's a kind of uh, impure blood going to the heart, it reaches capitalists. Isn't that the duty of a capitalist to return that purified wealth back to the, uh, uh, the, the labor class? 
So what happens here? The money goes up. And who is the real? Who are the real jewels here? Who, who are the real wealth here? It is those people who are working day and night for the upliftment of the nation. It is they who are contributing to the nation directly and indirectly. The wealth is amassed by the capitalists. But then what matters? John Ruskin. He is not a socialist. He is not a Marxist. He is not against accumulation of wealth. He just wants us to tell the tell the uh, capitalists. That you use the money that you have in proper manner. Why don't you return back that money back to them? And why can't there be a kind of a decentralization of the economy? And uh, this is what is how the economy is negatively being affected. Why can't you open your eyes towards it? It is they who are working for you, and you can't exist without them. It is they who are the real earners of the nation's uh, food, wealth, and why don't you want to give us a, a kind of a proper place for them? So somewhere the blood goes and the blood doesn't return and naturally the body is being diseased. So what, what, what kind of society will have? You will have a diseased kind of a society because the body will one or the other day rot without the proper blood. So this is how uh, he gives the definition, the veins of wealth. So the wealth that goes up must come down also. And this is nice and what does he talk he talks about two beautiful things uh, in this essay the one is he talks about the political economy this is a kind of a hypocrisy the political economy say that though there is no government intervention in the fields of economy we are democratic enough to look after the economy but then what is literally happening is political economy is producing capitalists in the name of a democratic appeal and instead of political economy they are following some kind of mercantile economy and what is mercantile economy they are the business people don't they are not hypocritic they tell it straight on the face that we have money we will we will invest uh, in our own way and uh, uh, if the government doesn't like uh, they can have they, uh, they can have questions on us and somewhere in some way even though they behave like dictators somewhere mercantile economy uh, people are better to political economists so in the, uh, the struggle of uh, de-rooting the mercantile economy from the society, uh, we brought in the political economy. But it so happened uh, that uh, there was no death of political economy in the country or in the world. So this is all uh, about the veins of wealth uh, where uh, he also speaks again uh, as to uh, the kind of wages. For example, um, when the person is working in the firm and when the person is being paid some 300 rupees and his own uh, person who is standing next to him is paid being 200, they have a kind of a discussion there. But then the, uh, the sentimental discussion that they have is totally being attacked by the uh, capitalists. So this is how the essay Veins of Wealth goes on and the same is being continued in the next two essays also. We have to have uh, uh, n number of readings of the Veins of Wealth. The roots of honor is somehow you know grasped. But then dear students to have a mastery of what exactly uh, he spoke in Veins of Wealth depends on your own experiences uh, of uh, a person in the field of economy or it depends on uh, a person's real sufferings. Uh, and uh, I would also want to tell something about unto this last year, uh, unto this last uh, influenced not only Mahatma Gandhi ji but it influenced Martin Luther also. But with the coming of our 20th century new criticism and uh, many other modernist thinkings, uh, we have a kind of a negative approach towards John Ruskin's writings because he was too, uh, too emotional. Uh, he, he was in kind of a fantasy while he wrote that. Because with the coming of Barth's um, uh, intentional fallacy, this was an article produced in 1968, uh, he told the readers that to be very careful before you approach a, a book of uh, literature or uh, any kind of a book that is meant there for social reformation or anything that is being told by a social thinker because it all depends on the contemporary conditions of that particular man or a writer and soon there, there is a kind of a change in his contemporary conditions there is a kind of a shift in his thinking also so now you can't rely simply on what happened in a certain age because that has simply changed in the coming ages following some person in a different age is too ridiculous is also risky so this is how we have a lot of critique on John Ruskin today. But then students, for the budding youth, this book is literally a jewel. And uh, to understand the title itself is a big journey. Hope you enjoyed this uh, uh, session. And in the next uh, video, we will also deal with the next two essays of John Ruskin. 
Thank you.